Hi there, my name is Vic Vera. I'm an ENT consultant surgeon working for the National Health Service in England. What I'd like to do today is explain to you how to read a sleep study. Now, the reason I'm making this video is that a lot of people are given this hugely complicated sleep study and then just told at the end, oh, this is your AHI or this is this number or this number. This is how bad you are. Go away and just use this device or have this operation. I don't think that's right. I think if you've got something that's a lifelong problem, you should know as much about it as possible and understand how bad or how good your sleep is. And then you can start thinking about how you can fix this for yourself and you take ownership of your own health problem. So I will try and break this down nice and slowly. And I'm sorry if I go too fast in some areas, please just rewind the video and start again in that area. Also, there are lots of different sleep studies out there, lots of different reports. I use the Nox T3, but if you have another sleep study, just look for the same value somewhere in that report. And do ask for the full report. Don't just get away with just a letter saying, oh, this is your AHI. You don't want their interpretation. You want the full report so you can look at the numbers yourself. So what I'm going to do is take you through lots of different sleep study reports and teach you something slightly new with each new study that I show you. So the idea is that with these mini tutorials of how to interpret different sleep studies, in the end you will have a much better idea of how to look at your own sleep study and understand what is going on with your own sleep issues. Now the first thing that most people look for when it comes to a sleep study is something called the AHI. The AHI stands for Apnea Hypopnea Index. And very basically this is a count of the number of times you stop breathing every hour on average. And apnea is when you stop breathing completely and causes disruption to your sleep. Obviously it's a little bit more complicated than that but on the most part this is what an apnea is. A hypopnea on the other hand is similar to an apnea but isn't quite as bad. Even though a hypopnea isn't quite as bad as an apnea they're still counted as one equal event and what happens is at the end of the night all the apneas and all the hypopneas are added up and divided by the number of hours you slept for. Obviously having no apneas and no hypopneas every night is completely normal but generally we accept up to five of these events every hour. What we're saying here is that less than five events every hour is considered within the normal normal limits and shouldn't really cause any major problems. As a rule of thumb, if the AHI is greater than 5 but less than 15, that would be considered as mild obstructive sleep apnea. So you've gone from normal to mild sleep apnea now. Obstructive sleep apnea is simply stopping breathing due to obstruction at the back of your throat. This is often associated with loud snoring and other health problems. If you want to know more about this condition, there are loads of videos about this on my YouTube channel. So have a look around and see if that would help you. If your AHI goes between 15 and 30, then you're likely to be diagnosed with moderate obstructive sleep apnea. If your AHI is greater than 15, generally this is when most doctors would give you a CPAP device. And when your AHI is greater than 30, you'd be considered to have severe obstructive sleep apnea. So congratulations, you probably know as much as most doctors who aren't interested in sleep apnea or sleep studies. What I'm going to do now is give you loads more information about how to read these sleep studies. Okay, so this is the sleep study of someone who we would call a simple snorer. What I mean by a simple snorer is that they do not have any obvious significant obstructive problems, but they're not completely normal. And you can see here in the top left hand corner that the AHI is 3.1. And if you remember, this would class this person within the normal category, with normal being between 0 and 5. If you look a little more closely, however, you'll see that that number of 3.1 is not an even distribution of apneas and hypopneas. 0.1 of that AHI is made up of apneas, and the other three are made up by the not-so-significant events called hypopneas. So therefore, most people in sleep medicine would look at this and consider this AHI to be not as bad as someone who had an AHI 3.1, which was made solely out of apneas. So when I see this in my mind, I slightly downgrade that AHI to take into account this ratio of apneas and hypopneas. It is also worth showing you the oxygen levels of a relatively normal person. In a non smoker most people have an oxygen level of over 95% oxygen in your blood. The oxygen levels do go down a little bit overnight because they do not need to breathe so hard because you're resting and sleeping. On the other hand, if I saw someone with an oxygen level of 92% or below, I would normally recommend that they are given a little bit of oxygen via a mask or some nasal cannula. When the oxygen levels drop to about 88%, this is quite serious, and I think that most people would be starting to turn a little bit blue from lack of oxygen. As you can see here, this person has no problems whatsoever. This this section of the sleep study just tells you how much time you slept on your back, otherwise known as supine, and how much time you spent not in this position, which we would call as non-supine. Obviously non-supine positions can be divided into sleeping on your left or your right or sleeping on your front, which is also known as sleeping prone. 
Some people are surprised to know that the sleep machine can monitor exactly what position you're sleeping in at every moment of the night. You can see from this graph that we have the same positions mentioned here. Obviously S means supine, L for left, R for right and P for prone. And if you then follow the line across which displays the whole night's sleep, you can see the positions in which you slept in. So in this person they started off sleeping on their back and then later on at about 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning they rolled over and started sleeping on their right hand side. Although it looks like that this person is rolling around in their bed all night, this is actually quite normal and to be expected. You hardly ever see anyone lying in one position constantly for the whole night. Now this bit here which I'm highlighting is the amount of noise this person is making throughout the night and the scale is measured in decibels. The higher the number of decibels, the louder you are. This person is snoring at approximately 50 decibels which is the equivalent of someone talking at the level of a normal conversation, a bit like what we're doing right now. You can see that this person snores at this level a few times during the night but at other times they're not making so much noise in between these events. Now if you look back at the position that this person was sleeping in, you can see that roughly when this person sleeps on their back, they tend to snore. And when they're not sleeping on their back, they tend not to snore so much. If we quickly look back at the amount of time they sleep on their back, you can see that they spent 55.6% of their time sleeping on their back. And therefore, if we could reduce this, they're likely to disturb their partner less. So a simple positional device such as the slumber bump or some other option would be useful for this person to quickly reduce their snoring levels. What I'll do is I'll leave a link for one of these devices in the description. The fact that this person seems to only really snore when they're lying on their back would also mean that it's possible that the tongue is falling back when they're sleeping in this position and blocking their breathing ever so slightly, in which case it would be worth considering a mandibular advancement device, which is likely to be effective in stopping this person from snoring. Again, I'll leave some links in the description. So now we move on to another sleep study, and this person is slightly worse with an AHI of 8.8. .8. Officially, this puts this person solidly in the mild category, but I want to show another bit of detail here. And you can see here that the total AHI, which means the average throughout the whole night's sleep, is 8.8. .8. But if you decided to look at the AHI only when the person is sleeping on their back, and compare that to the time when they're sleeping on their side, you'll see that the AHI is very different in this case. This person's AHI sleeping on their back jumps up to 18.3, which if you remember is within the 15 to 30 category, Category, which puts this person in the moderate obstructive sleep apnea group. When they're sleeping on their side, their AHI drops down to a normal level of 4.9. So the reason why this person's overall AHI is 8.8 .8, because they spend more time sleeping on their side than they do sleeping on their back. Again, let us quickly look down at the ratio and you can see here that they spent 28.9% of the time sleeping on their back and 71.1% of the time sleeping in the non-supine position. So overall, if you take into account the amount of time you're sleeping in each position, the overall AHI comes up to 8.8. .8. If this this person had decided on this particular night of the sleep study to sleep 100% of the time on their back, their overall AHI would have been 18.3 and they would have been given a CPAP device. If however, on the night of the sleep study, they decided to sleep 100% of the time on their side, then their AHI would be considered normal and they would be told there's nothing wrong with them and told to go home and not worry about it. Therefore, it is very, very important that you look at the AHI very carefully and do not just take it at face value. So you can see that AHI number is almost meaningless unless you look at all the other numbers around it. Although it's useful to have an overall number for yourself, you have to understand where that number came from because two people with the AHI of say 10 could have very, very different sleep apnea problems. Going back to this sleep study that we looked at before, I want to draw your attention now to the oxygen levels. You can see here that the average oxygenation level of 94.5% is relatively normal, but suddenly you see that the lowest oxygen level drops down to 82%, which is a bit worrying. So let's have another look at the graph again. And you can see here that at the start and the end of the night, this person is actually awake. You can see that he's not supine left or right, he's actually up. And if you look right at the top, you'll see that he's moving around a lot in the movement section. I think he's probably walking around before or going to bed or getting up in the morning if you look at the other end of the graph. Often when people are moving around the oxygen probe can fall off your finger and not give you the readings that you need. You can see that the oxygen levels only really drop during these times at the start and the end of the night's sleep. So I think these readings are an artifact and should be crossed out of the interpretation of the sleep study. The moral of this story is that you really need a careful check of the graph, particularly when something doesn't make sense. Now going back to the time when this person was actually sleeping, it shows again that he only snores when sleeping on his back and with the eye of faith you can see that he does lose a little bit of oxygen also in this supine position. Now this next sleep study is going to firstly illustrate the point I made previously about looking carefully at the AHI. You can see here that the overall AHI is 4.5, which would be considered normal and many people would be told that they don't have a problem and sent away. Now that you know a little bit more however, you can see that if you look at the supine AHI, 
it is actually 18.9, which is in the moderate sleep apnea levels compared to the AHI when he sleeps on his side, which is only 2.7. You should at this point look at the time slept in each position, and you can see that he only slept on his back 11.3% of the time. Personally, I would have concerns about basing a diagnosis on less than one hour's worth of data, and you can see here that it was just under that at 54 minutes. If you look at the graph again, you can see that each time he sleeps on his back, there's an obvious drop in oxygen and an increase in his snoring noise. This happens almost every time, so I'm inclined to believe that this is a true representation of his breathing problem. I want at this juncture to point out some other things you should be looking out for in these sleep studies. Here you can see the RIP phase, and you'll learn more about this in my upper airway resistance syndrome video. But in essence, this is a measure of how much effort someone is putting into breathing. It is measured by these bands that go across your chest and across your abdomen. You can see he's trying very hard to breathe at these points, which again points to a real diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea, because there must be a reason why he's putting in so much effort at this point. Another thing I want to show you is pulse variability. This is how much the pulse rate changes, and you can see that he's normally gently plodding away with a normal heart rate of about 60, and then suddenly, particularly when he starts sleeping on his back, his pulse rate jumps up to almost 100. That's the equivalent of jumping out of bed, running up a flight of stairs. The fact that these coincide with all the other markers of breathing problems that I've just talked about is just giving us more evidence that these events are actually important and should be considered significant. I have seen sleep studies like this, which are actually due to wives kicking or elbowing their husbands to stop snoring. Of course, you wouldn't have the oxygen drop, but if you just see a bit of movement, a change in position, a rise in the pulse rate, you can sometimes blame this on the wife for all these events. Now in this sleep study, I'm going straight to the graph to show you a really bad case. Here you can see that this chap is snoring really loudly, almost 100 decibels, which is the equivalent of using a chainsaw or standing a meter away from the speakers in the nightclub. You can see that this gentleman also has problems sleeping on his back with clear oxygenation drops. And you can see his rip bands around his chest are showing that he is struggling to breathe. Let's see what this all looks like in numbers. Here you can see that his AHI is 65.9, which is double the usual threshold for severe. He's double severe. Interestingly, if you look down, you might be able to see that about a third of his AHI is actually caused by central sleep apneas. This is something that I haven't covered yet. Obstructive sleep apneas we know are caused by a blockage in the throat, but central sleep apneas are caused by the brain failing to tell the body to take breaths in the first place. The brain just somehow stops working and allows the body to go blue without telling the body to actually start taking breaths again. This is obviously a bit worrying when you see it, but often, just like in this case, it wasn't actually central sleep apnea. But obviously you do need to be on the lookout for it and not miss it. Another interesting thing here is that you'll see that the snoring level seem to drop when he sleeps on his back. This is very common, and you'll see here on the graph as well. Most people would expect the snoring to get worse when your sleep apnea gets worse. But if you think about it, when you're struggling to breathe and you can't get any air in because your throat is blocked, and you're going blue, well, then you're not actually going to be snoring very loudly, are you? The snoring can only happen when the air is passing. If you've stopped breathing and no air is passing, the snoring actually gets better as your sleep apnea ends up getting worse. And here you can see the effect of all these apneas. The oxygen levels have dropped a lot, down to 75% and he spent almost 10 minutes under 85%. But this isn't the worst case I want to show you. In this sleep study, this chap has even worse oxygen levels at night, and you can see that he hardly ever seems to be breathing well at all throughout the night. His AHI is 81.8 and his ODI is 120. Now ODI is very similar to AHI except that it places a greater emphasis on oxygen levels. And many people in the sleep medicine community think that this is a better score than AHI because it better correlates to how people actually feel during the day with their sleep apnea problem. Now if you look at his oxygen levels, he dropped his oxygen down to 65% and he spent 316 minutes with his oxygen levels below 85%. So that's five hours being blue and being suffocated every night of sleep. The fact that he's breathing twice as fast as you would expect doesn't seem to be quite as scary considering all the other numbers I've just given you. You may have seen in one of my other videos about upper airways resistance syndrome, I'm going to show you a few of the things that we look for in sleep studies that pick up this condition. So here is a relatively normal looking sleep study. The AHI is within the normal range, including when you look at the supine values. The oxygen levels seem fine, all again within the normal range. The graph on the first inspection looks okay with normal oxygen levels throughout. I guess there is a little bit of snoring between 3 and 4 a.m. when he's sleeping on his back, but I think there are some other things we ought to be looking at in this graph. The rip bands show an increased effort of breathing, particularly when this person's sleeping on their back. You'll see that the pulse is a little bit variable, but nothing really to suggest why. 
Now, if you look at the bottom of the graph, you'll see that something called flow limitation has been raised. Flow limitation measures the flow of air through the nose, and you can see here that it seems to be like there's something going on here. Let's go back and look at the numbers again. And here you can see that the flow limitation is raised, and it does change root of position, which means it's not a constant thing like a blocked nose. Anything over 10 to 15%, I would say, is significant. You can also have a look at paradoxical breathing, which is also slightly raised. Paradoxical breathing is when the lungs and the diaphragm seem to be moving at different directions to normal, and is often seen when a patient is trying really hard to breathe but just can't get the air to shift. All of these are subtle signs which are pointing towards upper airway resistance syndrome. And as I said, there is a whole different video about this on my channel, but the typical patient is one that's been told there's nothing wrong with them, the sleep study is completely normal, but they insist that they're still very tired and have many of the symptoms of sleep apnea, and they just don't understand how their sleep study could be normal. These patients are often left and ignored, but thankfully we're learning more about this condition so we can treat these people more. So well done for getting this far in the video. I'm sorry this video has been so technical, but I hope now you understand that actually a sleep study is a bit more complicated than a single AHI number, and you have a better appreciation how much information you can get out of these sleep studies and how different it can be depending on how you look at the numbers. I've talked about an awful lot of conditions in this video, so if you look at the rest of my channel, you might find some more information that might be useful for you. But I've come to the end of this one, so thank you very much for watching. Take care.